I'd now like to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay our respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal people, past and present. Please welcome to the stage the German ambassador to Australia, Her Excellency, Dr. Anna Prince. Thank you, Kyle. And I'm well prepared. You know, preparation is like first makeup, then mic up, and then voice up. <laughs> so I w I'm German. I always speak more seriously. That's a German presentation. <laughs> and I will start formally with distinguished Bill McDermott, Professor Brian Byron Keating, hosts from the Australian National University, ladies and gentlemen, and friends who are interested to discuss today how leadership will manage future challenges. We all know that the future will look very different from now. We might become 100, our cars might drive us, mega cities might explode, we might have to work only three days a week, we can dream of the changes. We might even have a drink together later. <laughs> but how do we make the right choices? Change is gaining speed to an extent that people feel a kind of digital gap in their not yet digital mind. How do we pave the road to success for society? What kind of university training and research and lifelong learning do we need? What kind of dialogue and social policy? Who is deciding on future standards for production and life? And how do we empower people to decide on their life in a digitalized society? Well, these are political questions and Germany and Australia are dealing with it in a working group on Economy 4.0, which is much more than destructive industry, a term used in English. It is more on managing the next industrial revolution and not to be managed by it. Therefore, after the last G20 uh, meeting in Brisbane, we started a high-level advisory group between Germany and Australia and we set up working groups on Economy 4.0, as we call it. For example, in Australia, it's SAP leading the working group on labor, on the future of labor, and the dialogue on it. In Germany, we have also SAP leading the Economy 4.0 group, together with Siemens, with Bosch, with lots of very important companies, but also including civil society, including trade unions, and they come up with recommendations. That's very important political work for the future. We um, had on the Australian side, Minister Corman heading the advisory group, and he's now patron also of a very high level conference which will take place between the 3rd and 5th of November in Perth, and will bring together leaders, political leaders and also companies to see how we can promote change, but also how can we cooperate better on that. Well, this is why I'm thrilled today to meet you. You are one of the most interesting and outstanding global leaders. Bill McDermott is the chief executive of SAP, as you know. And this is the biggest German software company, and he's the first American to lead it. In order to go global, we need to embrace differences and we need to have some aspirations for the future with different views. He is uniting the experience uh, of different continents and he is leading this dialogue with world political leaders in many countries for a future and a better, so that the future will be a better place. Well, he is heading a company with 87 
0.100,000 employees. This is, of course, more than 10 times as much as a foreign uh, office has employees. And as a company, SAP is contributing to more peaceful change and future because it is offering solutions to problems. And I think this is true diplomacy. So in a way, we are colleagues, Bill. <laughs> um, you once said, trust is a new human currency. And this made me think a lot. Trust we have to build. Trust that a global company can democratize information and can be a game changer in a positive way. This is very important. Coming back to SAP, we have also Karen Swissler here, who is heading the uh, working group on labor economy 4.0. Well, how does, how does Bill manage to be so popular in his company when I read about it? I have trouble to be popular in my embassy, so there must be a very special quality to you. Um, with so many employees, and I think the real miracle and what I want to learn from you is how you make 87,000 people think alike so that they want to contribute to solutions. That's the task and it's a difficult one. Well, there are so many questions to be discussed and you're looking forward probably to a very interesting hour of discussion to come up. Well, I think we have here together people, not only from uh, the universities, there are many students here, we have researchers, we have companies, we have government, and that's the dialogue we need. Because we have to become game changers and we have to sh shape the future. Bill has come here today to share his vision and build trust that together we will be not a victim of the next industrial revolution, but will profit from the recovery of the global economy due to true leadership. Bill McDermott and Professor Keating, the stage is yours now. Thank you very much. Very well, thank you. How are you, Bill? All right. I think you guys got to get ready to have some fun. We cannot <laughs> be... Come on. Let's go. Come on. So um, you've been in Canberra today, uh, meeting with the people up on the hill, I understand. Yeah. We had some good meetings. Yeah. First time to Canberra? Uh, it is. Okay. And what do you think of our great city? I'm, 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 it's a bit of a leading question that you see. <laughs> I, I love it. You know, we have had an unbelievable time here. Um, today on the hill, as you mentioned, yeah. uh, with some great people. I haven't seen any kangaroos yet, but I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, also in Sydney the last couple of days, mm. love the country, mm -hmm. the people. It's been a great honor. Fantastic. And of course, you're welcome here to the ANU and also to Australia. And we're really happy to have you here with us today, Bill. Thank you. Um, but let's, I mean, one of the reasons we, um, one of the things we're going to be talking about today is obviously your book, Winner's Dream, and uh, in particular, some of the lessons that you shared within that book. Right. And I was actually, I mean, I've spent a few days um, just really um, re-familiarizing myself with, with the book and, and some of the, 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 the stories and the experiences that you shared there. And, uh, and I, I, you know, the idea that you were able to start from such humble beginnings. Yeah and then be able to rise you know, through the ranks in not one, but two multinational corporations right. um, to take the, the helm, the CEO of, of SAP, is a, a significant tribute to you as an individual. I was just hoping you might be able to share some of the, some of the, you know, some of the more memorable aspects of that journey. Well, thank you very mm -hmm. much, uh, Professor Keating, and also Ambassador Prince. I feel so honored um, by the kindness you've shown me here. Um, you know, a lot of people uh, have worked hard in their lives, so there's nothing special about that. I'll just try to give you um, my little story. Um, I lived in a, uh, a home that didn't have a lot of money, um, but we had a lot of love and a lot of fun. And I always liked to work. 
I think work is the essence of a person's imagination. When you get working and you meet people, you, you kind of get ideas and you can do things. And I guess the claim to fame or the one uh, story that's pretty interesting in the book is trading in three part-time jobs as a teenager um, to become a teenage entrepreneur and run my own business. Mm -hmm. And I think the part that people seem to enjoy about that story is just how real and practical it is. When you have a small business, you have to have customers that come in that are happy when they're there, so they keep coming back. If mm -hmm. they're not happy, you don't make payroll. So we really had three types mm -hmm. of customers um, because I had two big competitors on either side of me, mm -hmm. a 7-Eleven and another large supermarket chain. So the little one has to do what the big one is either structurally unable to do or unwilling to do. You have to find the space where they're not and then go strong. So uh, we delivered to senior citizens because they didn't want to leave their house. Mm -hmm. We gave blue collar workers like my dad credit because they got paid on Friday and they were flush rich on that evening and they were broke by Sunday morning. But the hard part was the young people. Back then it was the emergence of this thing called video games. Remember that? I do. And you actually had to put quarters in the video games then. I think the coins are a little bit bigger in my day. But so. Right. If you don't believe me, it's, uh, it's on wiki. I, I can validate <laughs> this. But my big competitor actually would line up right next to the high school and have 40 kids online waiting to get in the store and only four in. And I would simply get there and ask them, why are you all waiting out here online when there's a big store in there? And they said, well, they don't just think we're going to take things. So don't worry about that. Follow me down to my store. So they come in 40 at a time. We get the video game room to keep them busy. We feed them well. And at the end of a long day, one of the young people said, Bill, when we want to play, have fun with the videos, mm -hmm. eat good food, and be treated with respect, we come here. And when we want to steal stuff, we go to 7-Eleven. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> have a little empathy for the customer. It pays off. Uh, so obviously you learned a lot of lessons during that early time mm -hmm. in your career. Is there anything in particular that you think that uh, you took from that and you now apply in, in the roles that you're in today? Every day. Um, mm -hmm. The most important thing is don't forget who the boss is. Mm -hmm. That's the customer. Mm -hmm. And if you can just frame that in your mind, you're going to be fine. The other thing is you have to have a great team. So um, you know, if you don't have workers that you trust mm -hmm. and believe in and have a stake in the enterprise, you, know, you can't do it alone. Mm -hmm. and I've always just kind of broken it down to, you know, focus on what you do well. Um, have a great product, build a great team, and deliver a great service. And if you do that, and you can tell a good story, you'll probably be okay. Mm. It's exciting. I mean, I, I, one of the things I, I read with interest was the transition from college to your first um, uh, role in a multinational corporation, right. Xerox. Yeah. How did that happen? Well, at the time, um, you know, I was running the delicatessen and you know, I didn't uh, decide to be a, uh, a chain of delis. I decided I wanted to go into a corporation and I was living at home at the time. We lived in an 1,100 square foot house in Amityville, Long Island. And I had just picked up my $99 suit at the mall. I charged it, of course. And our house flooded every time there was a high tide. So my brother carried me to the car out in the street so I wouldn't get the pants wet. Mm -hmm. My dad drove me to the railroad tracks. I get to the railroad, my dad lets me out of the car. And I said, um, I'm really charged up today. And he goes, you know, Bill, do the best you can. I said, Dad, I guarantee you I'm coming home tonight with my employee badge in my pocket. And my, my dad said, you're a good kid. Don't put all that pressure on yourself, Bill. Mm -hmm. Just do the best you can. I said, I guarantee it. <laughs> get up the escalator, get on the train, read the annual report. And the CEO then was reinventing that company, Xerox, mm -hmm. on total quality management. Mm -hmm. By the time I got to the city, I was possessed by the change agenda. And I wanted to be the next David Kearns. Mm -hmm. who was the CEO at the time. A dream matters. Everybody else that day was going for the sales job. I wanted to be the next David Kearns. Mm -hmm. But then I get to the hiring center. At the top of the sixes in Manhattan, the most glorious building, I walk in, and there's gorgeous people like you in the room, fit, finished, mm -hmm. everything gorgeous. And I look around the room and I'm like, man, I might have overshot it a little <laughs> bit with my dad, you know? I'm in trouble here. 
you know, I'm the kid from Long Island, you know, just gotten out of college and, you know, it was, a, it was big time. Mm. But I came to the determination that there's two things I could do. I could panic because it looks too hard or I could just do what I do well. And that's talk to people because I talk to 500 people a day. Mm -hmm. So I just say, hey, what are you in for? What are you trying to get done today? What's your goals? What's happening? Where are you from? And people would say things like, I'm from Princeton, New Jersey. I'm from Greenwich, Connecticut. What are you trying to get done? Oh, I'm playing the field. I'm an interview at Goldman Sachs and IBM, maybe even Merrill Lynch. And that's when it came over me. Today's my day. Mm -hmm. You know why? Because I want it so much more than you. And after eight interviews, I get to the final one at 9 West 57th. Meanwhile, I'm left on the bench next to another guy. I thought they forgot me. They probably did, by the way. But I go up to the um, secretary, Joanne Siciliano was her name. And I just give a little note, Bill McDermott, tell Mr. Fullwood I'll wait as long as he wants. I'm not in a rush. I just want him to know I'm here. Within a minute or two, I get invited in. As I'm walking into his office, I look over his shoulder to Central Park. And that was the moment I realized I wasn't in a job interview. I was in a fight for my life. Because if I could get that job, I literally changed the course of my life. I could control my own destiny. We sit down, just like you and I are, have a great conversation. And at the end, he goes, Bill, it was a really good talk. The HR department is going to get in touch with you in the next couple of weeks. <laughs> You ever hear that one before? Yes. <laughs> to which I reply, uh, you know, Mr. Fullwood, I don't think you completely understand the situation, sir. Mm. To which he replies, like with the tilted head, I haven't broken a promise to my dad in 21 years. Mm -hmm. And I guaranteed him I'd have my badge in my pocket tonight. Mm -hmm. I say nothing. Now he really kind of tilts. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he goes, Bill McDermott? As long as you haven't committed any crimes, you're hired. And I said, do you mean it? I'm hired? I haven't committed any crimes. Well, good on that. So I basically go around this little table we were at. I pick him up, carry him around a little bit, placed him down safely. Yeah. And then I, you know, left, went down the elevator, ran to 57th Street and 6th Avenue, plucked quarters into the phone. You had to do that back then. And I got my mom and dad on the phone. I said, we got the job, dream job, get ready, break out the Corbell. Now, Corbell is the cheapest champagne that was ever invented. <laughs> and that was the start. And I can honestly say today, mm. I feel the passion that I felt that moment all over again. I'll never forget that. So, you know, mark those special moments down that make you mm. feel so alive and never let them go. You know, just in the, the account that you just shared with us, you, you talk about um, having a desire, a passion, mm -hmm. having an, an appetite to be mm -hmm. successful. And when yes. you spoke to the, the other people that were interviewing for the job, it was clear yeah. that, that they didn't have that same appetite. I mean, how important has that been in your career, just having that appetite, that, that hunger? Everything. Mm -hmm. you you got to want it more. I mean, of all the things, you got to want it more. And if you're doing something that you love, mm -hmm. you want it and you want it more than anyone else. So people say, you know, how can you keep up the pace? How can you do this mm -hmm. and how can you do that? I'm having fun. I could have, you know, a day like this and be on stage with you mm -hmm. and get tired? Mm -hmm. Not a chance. So I think that, you know, the first thing is do what you love mm -hmm. and do it with great passion and, you know, always try to be the best at what you do. So I mean, 17 years with Xerox, that's a long time. It is. You rose through the ranks yes. to a, a vice president role within the organization and the youngest vice president in the organization's history, as I understand, and, and then you made a decision to leave. Right. Tell us a little bit about what, what prompted, what provoked that change. Well, a lot of water went under the bridge mm -hmm. and some really fun stories. Um, you get to a point where, you know, I was a division president, corporate officer, <laughs> And, you know, at that time, you know, I was in my mid-30s and I had people saying to me, you know, as a corporate officer, do you realize that you will get the top five earning years averaged out in perpetuity for the rest of your life? You're mm -hmm. made, Bill. It's, mm -hmm. you're, you're there. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're there. And I'm like, 
no, I'm not there. I'm a work in progress. Mm -hmm. And when I started to feel like I wasn't learning as much as I could, that our division was growing at 40%, but it was disrupting the core model, and people didn't like pressing on the margins, and they were busy in conference rooms with Excel spreadsheets, deciding on how many people had to be laid off. Mm -hmm. I like, I want to grow something. Mm -hmm. I want to do something great. And my motivation for staying at that time would have been to be the CEO, mm -hmm. which is still a great honor. Um, but at that time, I thought if I left, I could learn more mm -hmm. and therefore know more and do more in my future. But I have to say, it was the toughest, toughest mm -hmm. business decision I ever made. Mm -hmm. I mean, pain. Mm -hmm. Because I loved it, I and I loved the people. <laughs> they were family to me, and they still are, by the way. And I guess you spent um, some formative years during your time there uh, learning to how to transform businesses. Yeah. I mean, uh, some stories you tell about um, the time of Puerto Rico and, yeah. and, and, <laughs> and uh, in the Virgin Islands. I mean, why is transformation so important? Is that really the core of your strength as a leader? I think so. Um, mm -hmm. You know, little funny story on that. Like at the time, I was, you know, kind of Mr. New York. You know, living in Manhattan, reasonably newly married, new baby, everything perfect, mm -hmm. career going great. And the promise is that you'll get anything you want. First opening, and they always happen, you're getting the whole thing. And then an offer comes in where the big boss asked me to go to Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands to turn around a business that was ranked 67 out of 67, dead last. Mm -hmm. And there's two kind of people in this world. There's the one that does it just for them. I want the right title, the right conditions, everything mm -hmm. perfect for me. And then there's the other one that is in service to the cause, whether mm -hmm. that's a company or a mission or something special. Mm -hmm. You're in service. You've been asked to do something on that person. Mm -hmm. So the decision was clear. I've been asked to serve. I know that if you take on a tough assignment and you make it great, mm -hmm. that they won't forget you for it. So we go to Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. And what was amazing about Puerto Rico in terms of leadership style, they're all expecting the American to come in, overdoing it with the vision, and here's our strategy, and let's go. And instead of doing that, I was reading Spanish for gringos, listening to Berlitz tapes, and walking around for two weeks, just asking the people, hey, how you doing? How have you taken losing to such an art form level? <laughs> I mean, you guys are really good at it. You do it every quarter and every year. How is it happening? What's going on? And you'd be amazed. Um, as you started that conversation, people give me the answer to the question, and it really came down to three mm -hmm. things. And this is really an, an, the essence of leadership. The number one thing is, you know, we want a vision. Where are we going? Number two, we want to be inspired when we go to work. Mm -hmm. Number three, the other guy was a cost cutter and he took away our Christmas party. And we like our Christmas party. Mm -hmm. And as it turned out, I basically asked them, well, of the three things, what's the most important? What do you think it was? The Christmas party. <laughs> so then we got into a visioning exercise. Well, let's play that out. If we do the Christmas party, where would it be? El San Juan Hotel. What would we wear? The women would wear this. The men would wear that. Fantastic. Who would be the entertainer? Oh, Hilbertito Santa Rosa. OK. Well, what if I think about this overnight, so I come back the next day. I get in front of them speaking broken Spanish. I was really bad with Spanish. And you'd hit all the bad words, and it was an accident, but they liked it. And we get to the point where I have to switch from my gringo friends, now I go English. And then I basically said, I got good news for you. I got you the El San Juan Hotel. You can wear your tuxes, you can wear your gowns, and Hilbertito Santa Rosa will be playing for you. My goodness, the place mm. erupted. You know, Senor Puno, you are the greatest. Rocky push ups on the ground, everybody's happy. <laughs> but I said, Look, there's only one challenge here. There's nothing noble about dancing to Hilbertito or anyone else while you're number 67. You got to do it when you're number one. 
silence. Oxygen completely removed from the room. Probably saying, let's get this gringo back on uh, a container ship to Manhattan. But I said, look, trust is the ultimate human currency. Let's go one day at a time. Give me a chance to help. You help me. We do this one day at a time. And lo and behold, three months, six months go by, and we're like sea biscuit turning the corner fast, fast. And we finish the year as the number one business in the world. Mm. And what was quite amazing about that, as I look back on it now, if enough people care, anything is possible. And everybody cared. Everybody wanted it more. It wasn't a me thing. It was a we thing. Mm. A couple of things come out of that story that I think are worth exploring. I mean, the first one is obviously finding that <laughs> something for, for people. Yes. But the second bit, which I, I'd like to deal with first, I guess, is this. So you had some early experience in working across cultures. Yeah. Now you turn the clock forward a little bit, and yeah. here you are. You uh, tap on the shoulder. Right. Um, you've been offered the, the uh, CEO of America role with, with SAP. Yeah. Um, not a totally dissimilar situation. Very good point. Um, how did you approach that challenge? Similarly, mm -hmm. actually. So you're on to something here, Professor Keating, because you know, going into that situation, I had to tell you a funny story. I show up on a Friday afternoon. The first guy that meets me on a Friday afternoon, I'm talking 3 mm -hmm. o'clock in the afternoon here, mm -hmm. is currently a board member that's been working with me since the beginning. Mm -hmm. So he went a long way on this meeting out in the hallway. I said, hey, where is everybody? He goes, oh, Bill, this place is a mess. Nobody comes on Fridays. I said, what? He goes, yeah, they don't care. I said, really? Yeah. He goes, let me take you into a conference room and just tell you how bad it is. So he's writing down all, all the things that have messed up. I said, uh, anything working around here? No. <laughs> so we had a, a great company with an unbelievable brand and the best technology in the world. But the America's component of it lost mm. touch lost empathy for the customer. Mm -hmm. And I think arrogance is the force multiplier against good. And once we got it back to the compass is on the customer and their customer, it's on the solution and value creation mm -hmm. and being in service to the customer's mission. We started to put formulas in place mm -hmm. to completely rethink how we engage the customer, took care of the customer, and ultimately helped the customer achieve their goals. Mm -hmm. And that's not dissimilar to the way it was in Puerto Rico. But the main thing is, and this is a big thing that happened then, I had 13 direct reports at that time. Um, by the end of like the first 30 days, um, we had about two people that were still on that team. <coughs> now they weren't all asked to leave the company, mm -hmm. And if you're saying, well, why are you like so tough that they have to go? No. Our expectation was that we were going to, in two years, do what it took everyone else 30 to do. And to some people, that is scary. And a lot of people are afraid of success, afraid of going big. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I wasn't. And there was a few people around me that weren't. So we decided that the management team really had to rethink whether they wanted to be a part of something like that or not. And a lot of people opted out. And uh, that was a good thing because we had to get the right leaders to support the vision. Mm. It's interesting actually because I, what you just described is a really good example of the difference between change management and, and, and really transformation. Yes. So change management could be incremental, can't it? But right. transformation is you've got to build something, you've got to scale it, and you've got to take it in a direction that hasn't been before. Exactly. Your ability to do that in the US obviously caught the attention mm -hmm. of, your, uh, of your peers, but also you know, senior management in, right. in Germany. Right. How, did the, how did the call come? To be CEO, CEO yeah. to be ultimately CEO. Um, in route um, with my family um, to Hawaii for the mm -hmm. top performance trip, and you have to stop in Phoenix um, on your way to Hawaii if you're coming from Philadelphia. And I'm in a hotel room, we had stayed the night, got up the next day, and the call from Hustle Platinum, the chairman, um, was basically laying out the fact that the board had voted unanimously 
um, to have um, me be the co-CEO of SAP. And I asked him, well, who was the other one? <laughs> um, and he told me it was a great friend, uh, Jim Hagemans Nava, and I was very happy about that. And it was uh, really the honor of my professional life, and mm -hmm. I was extremely fired up and ready to go. Mm -hmm. I've been working my whole life for that call. So thinking back to the the boy in the deli, yeah, and uh, in your, your first jump to a job in a, a multinational corporation with Xerox, and then the journey that took you on. When did you have the vision that you wanted to be a CEO? I take you on that original train ride. Mm -hmm. I think the, um, the dreams that young people have mm. get anchored early. Mm. I remember this one paragraph actually in the annual report where David Kearns was talking about losing to offshore competition mm. because Xerox was building products at a higher price point mm. than the competition offshore was selling products that were of a higher quality and a higher standard that the change management would be non-trivial and almost devastating if it wasn't um, accomplished. And to me, at that moment, as I was going in there that day, I'm like, I didn't think about carrying around brochures and selling products. I thought about, wow, that is cool, where you could be in this center of such controversy, such mm. excruciatingly difficult challenges, and lead people out of them. Like that was the role that I really got my head around going in on that train. So that whole day in the interview cycle, I just talked about total quality management. I talked about the products. I talked about the competition. I talked about the customers, how disillusioned they must be to pay so much and get so little that that had to change. And I think that surprised people. And that happens, so the transition into the SAP role the same expectations, the same challenges were ahead of you, were they? I think the, um, mm. the SAP role were very different challenges. Mm. Um, we, you know, 2008 was a pretty serious financial crisis. I think you all remember that. And then 2009 was kind mm. of a slow recovery. Mm. SAP was a market leader, a great company mm. with a great brand. Um, but it wasn't performing on the innovation side or the results to mm. its high expectations. And I think that's why the board was interested in making a change. At that time, we needed a strategy. And we decided that we had to be a purpose-driven company. Mm -hmm. To Ambassador Prince's point, we had to set a vision that would initiate every single woman and man in the company mm -hmm. to follow the North Star, which was to help the world run better and improve people's lives. And helping the world run better was how we build and master the art of great software improve people's lives was to give them a much more beautiful user experience, but also to help their companies be more sustainable, help the environment be more um, precious for the next generation, and obviously to improve the economic outcome, not only of commercial entities, but also public sector entities all over the world. Mm -hmm. So it was a bold plan. Mm -hmm. But that vision led to a strategy mm -hmm. that was a transformational strategy. And here was the idea. Don't build things in celebration of the way things were. Build them in anticipation of the way things need to be. Data in the world was doubling every year. Um, the world was going to adopt cloud computing as a pervasive theme. Everything at that time was mobile. That was the big era, by the way, 2010 of mobile devices in the enterprise. It just started, incidentally. Mm -hmm. Um, so we wanted to captivate the future, and that led us on a multi-year plan to really double down innovation, get focused on the customer, and build an amazing brand, an amazing team. Mm -hmm. And that strategy is still in full flight today. Mm -hmm. Why do I tell you that? Because I think all leaders owe their company at least a vision for where it needs to go and a strategy for how it will get there. People deserve a strategy from leaders because without the strategy, the good people, they just work harder and harder and they dig a deeper ditch to nowhere. You have to know where you're going and it has to be a course 
that has a good shot at being mm -hmm. successful. Mm -hmm. I might pick up one of the themes I, I kind of highlighted a little earlier, and that's that idea of that multicultural cultural capability. Right. So here you are, American. Yeah. The first, you know, in a, in a first CEO of, of, a, of, of SAP. Right. Um, I'm assuming the cultures were a little different. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> The things you learnt in those early days with Xerox, I mean, did they inform the way you actually went about building sort of ownership of that, of that vision, that strategy within SAP? Yeah, without a doubt. Mm. I think the whole journey has really been the reward because each step along the way, you've learned something new, you've mm. become better. Mm. And, you know, if you're intellectually in, in, inquisitive, you're constantly trying to figure out you know, what's next in you and what's next in the colleagues you're looking to serve. But what I learned is this. I, I tell people all the time, like, you know, what is the key to this thing? Be you. You know, my mom told me a long time ago, the best part of you is you. And the best part of everyone here is you. You are a unique brand of magic all unto yourself. And being authentic and comfortable in that is essential. In my case, I recognize going into a German culture especially when I was on um, the European side of the pond, mm -hmm. that I would be a bit American uh, for Germany, mm -hmm. that probably they'll be trying to figure out who is this guy and what's he up to. But I didn't want to change me to falsely answer that question. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be consistently me so people could understand that even though he's different, <coughs> even though he's different, he might actually have really good intentions and just maybe, we need that difference. And maybe that could be a superpower to help us be mm -hmm. successful. Just like I couldn't be me without the great developers in Germany and without the multicultural corporation that's behind my back every day. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the sum of the parts is much greater than the whole. And I think our diversity makes us much closer in the end. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great uh, segue into an opportunity to invite the audience to, uh, to, to ask a few questions. I might invite Kylie forward just to uh, oversee that part of the conversation. By all means. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Hey, thank you, Professor Keating, for your interesting questions tonight. Um, especially to Bill as well. I really like that bit about you know, being you making sure mm -hmm. that you really embrace that. I really yeah. took that on board. Thanks. And I love the insights into leadership that you had. And looking around the room here, I can see people are pretty enthralled with some of the things you've had to say. So I think um, I'd like to invite uh, Her Excellency Dr. Anna Prince up to the stage, because I know that she had a burning question, but I'd like to let you know, uh, Her Excellency, that a little birdie just leant over and told me that you're very, very popular at the embassy, and not to worry. <laughs> <laughs> I have no doubt about that. <laughs> so do you have a question? Yes, thank you very much. I mean, being German, of course, I was interested also in this question. Uh, what's the difference between Germany and uh, the American style? And your answer that, in particular, it's the difference that is the add-on, is interesting. And if I see a lot of Asian students here yes. also, of course, if we look at the future, where Asia plays such a big role, with population growth, with big cities, with solutions, right. what is, how do you incorporate, as a global player, the Asian part? Yeah, it's a very good question, uh, Your Excellency. So first on... Uh, the German and the American thing. Um, in America, for example, if you're the CEO, you have an external board of directors and you're kind of the chairman or the CEO of external people that come in and guide you on running the company. In a German company, you're the CEO, there's a chairman, and you also have employee representatives as well as external directors. And why I think that's a very special and preferred option is because I'd rather have the voice of the people in the process where the big decisions are being made up front than to make big decisions only to find out you probably left some things out when you made that decision without the input of the people. You know, when I was in Puerto Rico, one of the slogans we had is, the people speak and I obey. And I think leaders that have the courage to take the feedback and make better decisions in the image of where the people that know the most because they're closest to the action are, I think those are the best leaders. Now, as it relates to 
uh, this amazing region. This is where the growth is. I mean, if you think about um, these economies, both the emerging ones and the more mature ones, but all of them are changing, and they're changing fast. So the data, the process of demand and supply chains and the complexities thereof, how you apply the logic of deep machine learning and artificial intelligence and IoT, these are all cutting edge issues in this region of the world, and that's where we've centered our brand mm -hmm. and our commitment to R&D. So I believe that this is um, an epicenter for innovation, for young people with brilliant minds and imaginations, and we want to play a significant role in building that bridge to the future with this unbelievable region in the world. Really phenomenal. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you. So I'll take questions from the audience now. We have um, some roving microphones as well. So please just wait for the microphone to come to you. So um, hands up, any questions? Yep, one here at the front. So can we get a microphone down to the front, please? Sorry, it's a little congested. Um, anyone else with a question? And then we can get the mic. Okay, so can we get a microphone to this gentleman here, please? Uh, hi. hi, Bill. My name is Ryan Van Lant. Um, hi, Ryan. Your, your journey has been one of you know, continual personal development and, and lifelong learning. Um, I'm interested in what advice you might give to the students and those of us who are already in the workforce about continually developing new skills and really creating opportunities to um, learn about emerging markets and, and emerging technologies. Well, thank you very much, Ryan. Um, in terms of giving you my piece of advice, First thing I would say is, do what you do well often. Don't be so obsessed with doing what you don't do so well. That's the way I've really played it. And I choose to hire great people around me that fill in the blanks of the things I'm not that good at. And nobody's great at everything. And you have to be courageous and you have to enjoy teams. That's the essence of life, is teams. So I would encourage everybody here to, don't, to, to stay self-secure and to believe in you and to believe in your unique attributes and strengths. Of course you can work on the things that are not your strong suit, but you will not be the greatest in the world at the things you're not that good at today. There's just not enough time. I would also say, in terms of uh, what you might want to think about and develop, is first thing is, what's your winner's dream? <laughs> because there's a perfect correlation to that dream and that passion that burns inside you and the ultimate outcome. And I think if you just set your sail and start to get comfortable trying to find the answer to that question, you'll be able to fill in the blanks without anybody's advice. The thing is though, a lot of folks are like, I just don't know. How many people here don't know what the dream is right now? Wow, you guys know your dream better than most places around the world. We do train our students well, Bill. Yeah, yeah. I mean, wow, can I come here for like an MBA program? Or something? No. But um, I think the idea is if you do know your dream, that's fantastic. Um, but if you don't, start doing things and learn by doing, learn by failing, learn by reinventing and creating new trials. Um, because it's only by doing where we live it, we learn it, and we figure it out. Okay, thank you. Um, could you please just state your name to and where you're from? That would be helpful. Sure. My name's Stephen Bartos. I'm the CEO of the Australian Research Alliance for Children and Youth. We're an organisation that uh, tries to bring about better outcomes for children and young people by doing the incredibly radical thing of basing policy and programs on <laughs> evidence rather than politics or good intentions. Right. Um, we are looking to the long-term interests of uh, Australian kids and uh, very frequently uh, in recent uh, years we've had CEOs of tech companies telling kids that there's no future because the new machine age means that their jobs will disappear uh, and uh, the future of work is bleak 
And you haven't said that, no. which I love. Uh, I, I disagree with that perspective because business and human relations is all about the people thing, and, and that came through very strongly from you. What's your message of hope uh, to counter uh, the CEOs of other tech companies uh, that have told kids that uh, uh, machines are taking their jobs from them and Skynet is going to eventually destroy them all? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, Stephen. Um, first of all, uh, we, I am a big believer that technology can enhance the human outcome. It doesn't have to destroy it. So in the darkest imagery that you painted with some of these CEOs, probably there's standards and there's rules, and we have to protect against evil systems just like evil people. But for the most part, I think it's such a complementary thing to have technology that makes life better for people, makes transactions more simple for people, and enables people to be much more productive. In the enterprise, for example, there's so many things that are colossal in so many companies today because they haven't <laughs> advanced the technology. They haven't adopted HANA, the greatest database in the world. They haven't modernized their end-to-end -end systems. They haven't put things in the cloud. They haven't capitalized on deep learning of the machine and the intelligence that comes from the computer and ultimately how you can create new businesses, new ideas on the fly. And what can that do to improve growth and prosperity? And the answer, to, in my view, is a lot. So I think you're going to see for a very long period of time this perfect relationship between the companies that invest in technology, including that support people and make their lives better, and more growth and more prosperity and outcomes. Yes, if a job can be automated because the computer does it better than the person, it will. But that frees up the human to do more interesting and compelling work and probably have a higher quality in the work that they do and more in enjoyment and fulfillment from the work. And yes, that's ongoing digitization of society, learning and education. But that's the way it's been for a long time now. It's just getting faster and probably better. But let's not be so bleak on technology. I think it can help humans. And our view is it's there to help and complement humans. Nothing replaces the judgment of a human being. I don't see anyone signing up today to run into the OR or the operating room with a robot. I think you want a surgeon you can talk to with the experience and the judgment to do what's necessary. It's the things that happen when it's not so cookie cutter, that makes being a human magic. Um, over here. Hi, Bill. Um, my name is Madeline Ashwood, and I'm a law and international relations student at the ANU. And just in regards to your journey of personal development and developing your personal skills as well, I was wondering how, when you encountered professional challenges, how you uh, maintained your sense of positivity and perseverance. Thank you very much. That's a really good question because um, optimism is um, kind of unique. And for me, no matter what country you're in, what situation you're in, it's the only free stimulus in the world is optimism. That belief that you know, tomorrow is going to be better than today and the anticipation of defeat is probably a lot worse than the realization. And even when you get a setback, they'll never for, for, you'll never essentially, and they'll never, okay, remember exactly why you failed. But they'll never forget, and you'll never forget how you came back. Gotta love the comeback. So a lot of it's trial and error, a lot of it's failing and getting back up again. Um, in fact, in the Xerox job, give you a funny story. Um, you know, you'd knock on 50 doors a day, and probably 49 of them would slam in your face. But there was that one that made all the difference. And usually it was the last call of the day. So stay with it, remain positive. But here's the most important thing composure. When everyone else is chaotic and the field is speeding up for them, just calm it down. 
relax. People are attacking you with questions that seem unfair. They just want an answer. Maybe they had a bad day. Maybe that's just their style. Don't take it so personal. You know, even when someone criticizes you, hmm, let me learn from that. That's a constructive piece of information. Might not be right, but it might be. Let me internalize that. I'm okay. So, you know, on one hand, you got to be optimistic. On another hand, you have to be composed. And on another hand, you got to be a fighter. Come back strong every time. There you go. There's a challenge for you. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll, I'll take one more question. I have been told that there is refreshments coming shortly. We're a little over time. So I'll just take a question from the lady here at the front. Thank you. Hi. Um, hi, Bill. Thank you for the inspiring presentation. My name is Katerina with the Australian National University and also trying to run two small businesses. Wow. Um, so I have a dream of people working remotely and from anywhere in the world. For data generation, already we have terabytes per second. Okay. For processing, we already have terabytes per second, and HANA does very well with that. Okay. But for transporting data, we're still talking about megabytes per second, and we're still talk talking about quotas and so on. There is definitely a need for transformation there. Yeah. Um, with regards with your work with the um, <laughs> European Working Group and uh, your vision of how SAP is going forward, what is needed to be done for the transport? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. You know, I um, had breakfast with a, um, a gentleman on uh, Sunday morning that runs a transportation logistics and advanced supply chain, and it's the same thing. You know, how do we move things in a digital world faster? How do we deal with remote areas? How do we get the fiber and the infrastructure to be quick enough to keep pace with that big, thick um, um, portfolio of data that's running through, and you need it to get from point A to point B quickly. All I can tell you is whether I'm on the European Roundtable, the Business Roundtable in the United States, or talking to CEOs such as the one this Sunday, it's investment, it's infrastructure, it's public and private sector. I know 5G is not that far into the future. Um, it's um, it's going to take a little bit of time. That's not specifically what we do. But I can tell you the companies that do that um, have a massive interest in getting that data moving around because there's a lot of money in it. So it's just time. It's time and money. And it's going to happen. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> you got the dream. Stay with it. Thank you. Um, so Professor Keating, would you like to ask a question now? Or? Um, maybe just a brief summary, um, yeah. I guess. We've heard today about an exciting journey of self-discovery, um, how an individual was able to overcome adversity and be able to turn that around to, uh, to find the drive to be a successful uh, businessman, but also leader. Now, we also heard about uh, the important role that transformative leadership plays, how Bill was able to, uh, through a number of examples, you know, work through very difficult circumstances and turn around organisations, but do so in a way that actually brought his organisations with him. Right. I mean, I, I guess we're really privileged, I think, today to, to be able to hear firsthand um, how to overcome many of those blockages that actually present barriers to, to many managers and leaders. So if I could ask a final question, of course. it would be this, is that um, you've come in uh, into the CEO role, the co-CEO role initially, now the CEO role um, for 2014. You've been able to oversee a pretty significant transformation internally within SAP, both in terms of technical infrastructure, but also in terms of the, the organization's culture right. and its ability to, to, you know, to, to get in behind a, a vision. Right. What's the next big challenge for SAP? Well, like myself personally, I think SAP is also a work in progress. Mm -hmm. I don't think that you know, you're ever done. So right now, you know, we think that HANA is only coming into its own now, even though it was way ahead of all the competition in the world, because how do you apply the logic of deep machine learning and artificial intelligence if you can't get to the data? Mm. So getting the data in real, in-memory context is so important. Um, we think the next frontier on ERP is having an ERP that is designed on an in-memory database. 
Um, we think that um, cloud computing, and matter of fact, in Australia, for example, cloud is already bigger than on-premise software for SAP, mm -hmm. and it's the fastest growing part. You know, whether that's for an executive running a line of business, or that is a corporation um, advancing their cause by getting on a global procurement network, for example, and buying things less expensively and more efficiently, and then accessing that network, perhaps even to sell their products into the network. In mm -hmm. the case of Ariba, where we have a trillion dollars going through a network with three million trading partners, mm -hmm. um, all of this is happening in real time. And then the next big frontier is SAP Leonardo, mm -hmm. where you're taking all of that information, that process excellence, that domain expertise in every industry, in every corner of the earth, and now you're applying deep machine learning, artificial intelligence, IoT, blockchain, to what's going on in those enterprises, whether they're small, medium, and large. And some people say to me, wow, I, I didn't know that SAP was for the small ones. Mm -hmm. Well, 80% of our customers are small ones. You run out of the Fortune 1000 after 1000, and it doesn't last that long. Um, so you have to go to, uh, to new frontiers. And they say, well, how can small businesses get so excited about this? And I said, I'm yet um, to find the small business that wants to say small. So you have to um, experience these technologies to get your vision through. Um, and what's the trick there? I think design thinking and innovation. To really think about what the dream is, the desirability. And then how are we gonna achieve that dream? The feasibility. And then will that dream pay off? The viability. And then I believe in a concept called dream box. We have to keep the world a simple world. It has to run simple and you have to be able to open up the box and essentially make that so simple for companies to consume that they can't help but be successful. And that's the art form. Mm -hmm. As Leonardo da Vinci uh, once said, the ultimate form of sophistication is simplicity itself. That's why run simple is a big idea. So mm -hmm. we're working on that. Sounds like very exciting times. Thank you. I'd like to ask you just to join me in thanking Bill McDermott, Thank the you. CEO of SAP, and uh, her Thanks, excellency. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Anna Prince. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you very much. Lovely. Um, oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Professor. Real pleasure. Thank you. Hey, thanks, everybody. Really nice to be with you today. Thank you. Thank you.